understand. Who likes robots? Who likes robots that don't kill people? Yeah, okay, <laughs> great. Well, you're in for a treat now. So uh, our, our next session is um, on doing robotics in Ruby. Uh, the uh, leader of this gang is Ron Evans. Uh, he's from LA. Uh, he, you may know him from uh, LA Ruby stuff, um, and also Kids Ruby. He's the uh, founder of the Hybrid Group, and uh, he's been doing Ruby for uh, you know five or six or seven or eight years, something, something like that. It seems like he's always been around. Since um, 2005. 2005. Okay, great. Eight, eight years, um, and he's got a lovely singing voice. So uh, I'll let him uh, introduce the rest of his crew. So Ron, take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Golden Gate RubyConf 2013. Amazing. Before we get started, I just want to give special thanks to Josh, to Jim, and to Leah, all the other attendees, all the conference organizers. Let's give it up for them. They work really hard. A true labor of love. So I am Dead Program. In the real world, I'm Ron Evans, but on Twitter, I am Dead Program. I'm the ringleader of the hybrid group. This other guy over here is A.D. Zankic, Adrian Zankic. He's the serious programming guy at the hybrid group. So he does all the work, and I take all the credit. Nice. <laughs> Just like grad school, exactly. So uh, we're with the hybrid group. We're a software development consultancy based in Los Angeles, California. And among other things, we are the original creators of Kids Ruby which this year was so fortunate as to be one of the recipients of the Fukuoka 2013 Ruby Awards. So thank you so much for all the contributors. <laughs> but here today we are talking about Ruby on robots. This is not one of our robots. So is innovation dead? I mean, is, are we just going to be doing web development and figuring out how to disable turbo links for the rest of our development careers? <laughs> I say nonsense. Actually, I say something a lot less polite. But I say nonsense here today. The future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. At least that's what William Gibson, the noticed author and futurist, had said. And isn't that really true? It's very interesting. Um, innovating is actually very, very hard especially when you're working with hardware. And my brother Damon and I started doing open source hardware development in about 2008, and we would order obscure parts from China that would be shipped to us in mysterious unmarked packages, and we'd put them together and they would immediately melt, and then we'd order them again. Nowadays, though, you can go and buy drones at retail stores. You can buy robots at the Apple store. It's a whole new era. The future's already arrived. So we are here to tell you about R2. R2 is Ruby on Robots. It is a Ruby framework for robotics and physical computing. It supports multiple hardware devices, different hardware devices, and multiple different hardware devices at the same time. In Ruby? I mean, are we serious? Yes. Because we use celluloid. The brilliant creation of Tony Arciaghi and team Celluloid is a remarkable piece of software that if you haven't checked it out, you're probably actually running it in production right now if you use Sidekick or you use Adhesion. So, ah, uh, yes, thank you, thank you. So, it's just Ruby, though. That's the beautiful thing about R2. It's Ruby code. It works in Ruby 1.9.3 and 2.0 on R. It works even better in JRuby with the concurrency. And our favorite Ruby, the one we're going to be primarily showing today, Rubinius, the Ruby of the future. If you are not using Rubinius, you should try. So R2 is to robotics like Rails is to web development. Let me say that again because I think it's a very important idea. R2 is to robotics like Rails is to web development. So let me show you what I mean. Here's a little example of some R2 code. Actually, it looks a little more like Sinatra, but let that, let's let that go. So this is, first we require R2. Then we make a connection to an Arduino using the Fermata adapter, which is a serial protocol to communicate with Arduino devices. Then we connect to a device, which is an LED. It's going to be connected on pin 13 on our Arduino. Then the work that we're going to do is every one second, we're going to LED.toggle, which is turning it on or off depending on the state of the LED. So we'll see this demo in a minute. But first, a little bit about R2's architecture. So the architecture of R2 uses two interesting design patterns. The first one is the adapter pattern. 
So you see that we have the robot, which is the primary class in our class model. And robots have connections. Connections are to specific hardware devices, and very much like Active Record is able to connect to different kinds of databases using the same interface, so R2's adapters are allow their connections to connect to different kinds of hardware devices. You also see that we have devices with drivers, where our connections control connectivity, actual ability to communicate. Drivers include behaviors. So our drivers are disconnected from our adapters because you can use some of the same drivers on different adapters. So you can have the same LED or buttons that work on a Raspberry Pi, on an Arduino, or any of a number of other devices. The other thing that's interesting is we use the publish and subscribe pattern. You'll see that we have events. So we detect different events when they occur in these drivers, and then we tell the robot about them so that it can respond. Something you're probably traditionally used to seeing in other languages that claim all evented programming. That shall not be named. All right, so the API of R2. Yeah, thank you, at least one token left. All right, so of course, what good is a robot without an API? So your application can communicate with R2's API using either a REST HTTP interface or WebSockets, the interface of the future. So this API communicates with the MCP, which is the master control program, which then communicates with all the different robots, kind of like a robotic routing system. So test-driven robotics. Historically, the way that you do robotic development is you install your software and you hit the on switch and you step back real fast. <laughs> like, would you try that in production, please? Yes. <laughs> so um, also there's a command line interface because all of the things that you need to do to connect with different robotic devices are a lot easier to achieve if you have a CLI. So without further ado, let's see a demo of some real stuff. We're going to start with the DigiSpark. So what is the DigiSpark? Let's see if I can uh, manipulate my user interface sufficiently. All right, so we've got our camera. So the DigiSpark is a very, very small microcontroller. It's really small. It's a USB device. It's probably the minimum viable microcontroller that you could actually have. It has a few pins on it, and uh, you plug it into your USB interface. So let's take a quick look at some code here. All right, so here's the sample code. Again, you see we require R2. We're going to connect to the DigiSpark using the little wire adapter. Little wire is another protocol, kind of like Fermata. That's a serial communication protocol with microcontrollers. The difference is little wire runs on very, very low powered and small microcontrollers like the ATtiny that's in this DigiSpark. So we have two devices. We have the board itself, so we can get some device info. And again, our canonical LED. So in this case, the work that we're going to do is we're going to display the firmware name and version off of the DigiSpark, then every second we're going to flash. So let's jump over to our camera and point it. This is our universal video adapter here. And there is the DigiSpark. And he is going to run this code, and if all goes well, it will start to blink. Voila! A $2,500 lamp. All right, so you're probably wondering about now, what good is all this stuff anyway? I mean, it's neat and fun, but like, what can you actually do with it? Well, you know, I'm glad you asked that very question. So here's another sample that we wrote. Uh, it also uses the um, DigiSpark, but it adds another piece of hardware, uh, an RGB LED. So this program is also requiring Travis, which is the Travis gem. See if you can guess what it does. Yes, it is a continuous integration build notifier that uses this hardware. In, uh, let's see how many, so the work that it does, if I can get my mouse over there, it's got the three different LEDs connected to different pins. The work that it does is it turns on the blue LED, connects to a repository called Broken Arrow, which has a failing test, then calls Travis, gets the status. Every 10 seconds, it checks to see the status of your build, if the build is green, it turns on the green LED. If the build is just building, it turns on the blue. And if it fails, it turns on the red. And then we have a couple of methods, one that turns on a specific LED and one that turns all of them off. So that's all there is to it. Let's jump over to our camera. Whoop. Our camera. So we're going to run this code. And if the gods of the internet favor us, OK, now it's checking Travis to see if Broken Arrow is uh, broken or failing or passing, and it should turn red once it queries. And yes, our build is failing. 
Every 10 seconds, it would keep checking it. And because we're really, really pressed for time, they assured me I would be kicked off stage with a large hook. We're just going to move on to the next thing, but it does actually work. All right, so um, we really, really love toys, don't we? And we really, really love cats, don't we? I mean, who doesn't love cats? But you know, slides of cats are really boring. What's interesting are internet-enabled cats. So uh, what we decided we were going to do was uh, we were going to uh, write another little sample. And uh, this one uses um, a couple of other things. We are still using our DigiSpark. We have uh, two servos. And we have a leap motion. So uh, we also have support for the leap motion in R2. In this case, we're going, the work we're going to do is we see the syntax here in R2 for event handling. The on leap motion hand wave, we're, we're going to call this wave function. So every tenth of a second, we're going to move the servos to the current x and y. So that's the work. We have an x and a y with default values that center the servo. And then our wave is basically querying the data that's coming in from the leap motion and then using a couple convenience methods we have to scale from its to scaling to what the servo wants. All right. So let's go take a look. And we see here we see the actual device itself. We'll get a little closer. You can see this was built, hand built by my brother Damon. It's got uh, two servos. Uh, it's connected up to the, go ahead and run it. It's connected up. You see here is the leap. And there's the cat toy on the end of it. Because we're very serious people. <laughs> All right, internet enabled cat toys. Yeah, that was pretty fun. All right, so let's now go and do something completely different. So um, 99, many people of a certain generation think red balloons. Others who are hip hop fans think problems. We, on the other hand, think that there are 99 people in this room who are going to be getting a free DigiSpark beginner kit by the uh, end of this session. So uh, after, right after we're done, some of our wonderful members of the hybrid group are near the doors. We have 99 DigiSpark kits that include, uh, it does some basic soldering is required. But it's everything you need to actually build that Travis notifier and about half of the cat toy. So uh, 99 problems, but the microcontroller is not one. <laughs> All right, moving on. So now we're going to show the Sphero. So the Sphero is a very, very cool robotic device that uh, has become really popular. It you know, pretty much seems like a toy. It's just a sphere with a couple of microcontrollers in it, one of which has got an accelerometer, a couple of motors. The thing rolls around. It's you know, really, really fun to play with. Let's take a look at how it works in R2. Let's take a look at some code here. All right, so here we see, again, require R2. This time, we're going to make a connection to the Sphero using the Sphero adapter, and we're connecting to an IP address port, because in this case, we're actually using a socket to serial interface. That way, we can send IP packets, and they turn into serial. And then the work that this does is every second, it's going to set its color to a random RGB color, and then roll around in a random direction. So uh, by the way, we're using the Sphero 2.0 now, which is, uh, what's up? Oh, oh, the BeagleBone, yes, thank you. Yes, I almost forgot. We're running this entire demo off of this BeagleBone Black, which is a $40, extremely low-cost Linux microcomputer that um, it has got a lot of I.O. capabilities. It's based on the ARM Cortex processor. And for 40 bucks, it's pretty amazing. All right, so now we're going to connect to the Sphero, which we will see kind of a powder blue color when it's actually connected via the Bluetooth interface. And then Adrian here is going to run the code. And voila, more robots, more robots. The Sphero 2.0 is a lot more powerful. You'll see it's like almost about to escape from the Sphero cage that we built. <laughs> this is only half speed. Sphero 2.0 is very cool. All right. So um, one of the things that we find really, really interesting, um, hmm, where is my presentation? Where is it gone? There we go. La, 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 la. I hate when that happens. Well, 
Well, yeah, don't forget those. All right, Conway's Game of Life. So who here is familiar with Conway's Game of Life? Okay, about maybe half of the people. So John Conway is a mathematician who liked to play with ideas, and one of the ideas he played with is something that we call cellular automata. And the concept here is by using very, very simple rules that apply to individual elements that we can have some emergent behaviors. What that actually looks like is this. It's typically played on a pad of graph paper. And so each of the squares that is filled in is a cell. The rules are as follows. If a cell, one of the little circles, has less than two neighbors, it dies on the next turn because of loneliness or what have you. If it has more than three neighbors, it dies on the next turn because of overpopulation. On the other hand, if an empty square has exactly two neighbors next to it, then a new little ball is born due to apparently the reproductive habits of cellular automata. So this is kind of what it looks like when you're running it, right? Here's turn one, here's turn two. So we thought we wanted to do Conway's Game of Life, but with robots. And we realized we're going to have to make a few little tweaks. One of them that, you can go ahead and start connecting. Uh, one of them is um, these don't have any ability to see each other. However, they do have an accelerometer and they're able to detect collisions. So if we do a little tiny bit of a trick where we take that square and we stretch it out and we use each of those collisions, a kind of an inverse Fourier transform for the mathematically minded, then we can take and we can actually simulate Conway's game of life in this particular fashion. So let's go back here to our code, take a quick, quick look. And so we see here we're using the class oriented. You can actually not just use that sort of Sinatra syntax, but that Sinatra the modular syntax. And so we have this robot, it, the work it does is it's born, it measures its collisions, every three seconds it moves if it's still alive, and every 10 seconds it has a birthday. Life is short and hard in Spheral Land. So we have a few tests here to see if it's still alive, resetting its contacts. Um, if it dies, it turns red. While it's alive, it's green. And on its birthday, if it has enough contacts to die, then it's reborn, otherwise it dies. And then we reset our contacts. And then we move around, and here we see that we're going to be connecting to six different spheros and then do its work. All right, so without further ado, if all goes as planned, the Beagle Bone Black and the Spheros are going to have a very fun time together. They live. Wow, look at them go. I might have to tape down the cage. So far, so good. It's a sunny day. Ah, oh, death has just come to the Spheros. But it's only one of them who's in the corner. They're not even noticing. Everything's fine. We're cool out here. Oh my god, another one died. And this is kind of harsh. Even artificial life forms I feel very sympathetic towards. Now some of them uh, will come back to life and uh, probably, oh, <laughs> oh man, <laughs> it's looking bad. I'm like, I, I, right now I don't want to kill the last one. But it's not looking good. It's trying to find love in all the wrong places. <laughs> now it's trying to go somewhere else. So this place is dead, man. Should we kill it? Please, little Sparrow. Get out, get out while you can. Go on without me, save yourself. Uh, well, in the interest of avoiding the hook, I think we should just uh, terminate the program. I'm so sorry, we're terminating the program. <laughs> terminating the program. All right, so um, let's see. Sphero! All right, so now we're going to do something completely different. We always, do say, we always say that, right? Now I'm going to bring out our test pilot and my brother, hybrid group member and wonderful human being, brother of the same mother, Damon Evans. <laughs> what he doesn't know is he is test pilot and test subject today. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. All right, so uh, let's take a look at some code. So what are we going to do now? All right, 
So uh, we're going to fly this AR drone using R2. In this case, you see pretty much the same pattern that you've been seeing. Again, we require R2. We make a connection this time to the AR drone. Uh, you see that we're connecting via a port. In this case, the AR drone is a Wi-Fi device. Um, the device is the drone itself. And the work that we're going to do is the drone is going to start. It's going to take off. After 15 seconds, it is going to land. And then after 20, it is going to stop. Is it alive? Oh, it's not plugged in. Once they can plug themselves in, <laughs> what then? I'll try not to think about that too often. All right, so let's take a little look. We are connecting. This is why he's a serious programming guy. We call this robot ops. Thrusters engage. Air drone. All right, so a bunch of you have seen that before, like other places. They're like, oh, that's cool. I really saw it. All right, so now we're going to show you something actually impressive. So one of the things that we've added to R2 recently is support for OpenCV. OpenCV is probably the standard computer vision library used in very serious robotics projects by very serious human beings. So uh, we added support to R2 for OpenCV recently. And uh, so what we're going to do in this particular example is we're going to connect to the capture device, which is going to be pulling the streaming video off of the AR drone itself. We're then going to put that through the processing device, which is going to do some analysis of it. Then you see the AR drone code pretty much from before. Uh, one little difference here is we are going to use a facial recognition library that's included with uh, OpenCV. So what's going to happen is that the work this drone is going to do is it's going to, on each capture of a frame, process that image. So we'll start by taking off. Then after eight seconds, it's going to increase altitude to approximately face level. Then after 10 seconds, it's going to hover. Then after 13 seconds, it's going to start a new timing loop, which every half second is going to try to detect Damon's face and then adjust its position so that it is looking directly at him. And then, hopefully it won't get any funny ideas at that point. Hopefully. It is at face level, after all. Your beautiful face. All right, and then after 30 seconds, it should land. So if all goes well, then this is what is going to happen. So let's take a little look at, we're going to use our universal video adapter here so we can actually see what's going on. Because you can see that, and now you'll be able to see what it sees. Uh-oh, -huh. uh -oh, Houston, we have a problem. That's how you stop the drone. <laughs> I got it. We're just going to reboot the server real fast. <laughs> Did you try rebooting the drone? Could you just imagine that kind of customer service? <laughs> you say customer service drone, and we mean it. <laughs> All right. One more try. This is how you know it's real, by the way. All right. We're going to try this again, hopefully. As soon as the Wi-Fi reconnects. This is why we were uh, going around looking for that uh, USB adapter. Thanks, Keith. All right, standing by. Red five, standing by. Uh, T minus and counting. All right, countdown, let's go. Uh, we're still standing by here, Houston. <laughs> uh, is there a problem in the launch gantry? Standing by. Oh, we're connected. Try doing this to Mars. <laughs> then complain. All right. You see our video. Let's get it. Let's zoom in. And you see it is see, it is seeing his face. Every time you see the red square, it is recognizing his face. I don't Thank like being in this radical. <laughs> it likes you. What do you mean?
Easy, boy. Easy. Down, boy. Now we're going to find out if that part that's supposed to make it land, maybe it has its own ideas. Oh. Ah. Oh, hey. Let's we'll see that there for a minute. All right, but there's more. There's even more. I know. All right, so here we are. We've seen the AR drone fly, and we've seen it fly autonomously. Now we're going to put it back under human control. And so we're adding some additional hardware to the mix. In this case, we've still got our open CV. We still have our drone. We're also adding an Arduino. In this case, the Arduino is using the Fermata protocol to communicate with a Wii Classic controller. Okay, so Wii Classic controlling the AR drone, which is using its video camera to stream through OpenCV, all controlled by this computer, if it works. And this human. <laughs> Standing by. By the way, um, he's going to fly this all around. Uh, we've been told we are fully insured. If it comes really close to you, duck. How are we doing, Control? Ready. Video activated. Starting engines, engaging takeoff. So it's looking at um, you, looking at it. Problem. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. Oh, lost the connection to the video. Uh. It's doing that similar reset. Is it going to regain control or something? Yeah. Oh, there it goes. Wait. Okay, so here are your choices. Let's try that. I think we should just, uh, we have two choices. One, we could fly it around without the video. Two, we could try that again. Reset. Three, we could do something else. Reset. I know, I said there were two choices. I lied. Again, same exact thing again, except this time it works. <laughs> well, actually, you know what? Oh, fresh batteries. Fresh battery. Yeah, fresh batteries. All right, I'll go get one. Fresh batteries. Yeah, the Parrot's whole business model is selling you more repair parts and batteries. We have learned this. We have a lot of dead drones. Porkins, we miss them. Yeah, Wedge has also gone MIA, which is odd. I thought he survived the attack. All right, plugging in. They have a new high capacity battery. I think we'll pick one up. <laughs> All right. One more attempt. Can we do it? Connecting to it. It's, it's actually, uh, the AR drone is actually its own Wi Fi access point, which proves to be very convenient when flying with your phone and proves to be quite tricky when integrating with other devices. But there are other drones coming. That's all I'm going to say right now. Standing by for takeoff. Still connecting. connecting. We are on the on-ramp to the highway to the danger zone. <laughs> Ron, what's the best way to measure your control when you have the drone involved? Well, um, if it's got facial recognition, do this. <laughs> 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 I swear, that actually worked. <laughs> <laughs> also a mask, baby. All right. Okay, cool. We're ready? ready? We are standing by. Now, you, it really, you guys in the front row look really close. There we go. Now that is air flight. <laughs> this just proves we'll be air superiority, my friends. <laughs> What's that? I'll take on those node comers. Bring it on. I'll stabilize my deflector. Hey, 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 this is a peaceful drone. I think we should I'll challenge it to a finish match. I view it a little bit more like Voltron Force combined. 
Actually, this is a great time to mention RobotsConf. RobotsConf is coming up in December in Florida. It's being organized by Chris Williams, who also organized JSConf. Uh, we're going to be there. A bunch of the NodeBots guys are going to be there, some Pythonistas, uh, some Clojure people. It is going to be the ultimate robotics open source conference Whoa. ever. Whoa. Hey. 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 <laughs> now that was dramatic. Well played, sir. So was that fun? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, so we want you to join the robot evolution. Go to check us out at r2.io. We're also on Twitter at r2.io. Because I, for one, say welcome to the machines. So what about robot economics? I mean, what happens when all the jobs are done by robots, right? What about robot ethics? Do they even have ethics? And uh, what is going to happen? The answer is, I don't know. Uh, however, I do have friends who are professional futurists. One of them is Daniel Rasmus, who wrote a great book called Listening to the Future. And in it, he talks about the thing that's called scenario analysis. So we're going to do a little brief scenario analysis here. We're going to look at two axes. One is robot friendliness. Are they friendly or not? And the other is robot sentience. Are they intelligent or not? And because we're based in Los Angeles, we think of everything in terms of movies. So if the robots are not intelligent and they're also not friendly, you get the movie Brazil. <laughs> Nothing works. In other words, the world we live in today. So if the robots are not friendly, but they are intelligent, you end up with Terminator. <laughs> Enough said. So if the robots are friendly, but not intelligent, you end up with Power Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> and then if the robots are intelligent and friendly, we get Singularity. So this guy spent a lot of time thinking about the interactions between humanity and robots. Everybody know who this is? Isaac Asimov. And so he came up with something that was quite prescient called the three laws of robotics. And I would like to share them with you now. Number one, a robot may not injure a human being or through an action allow a human being to come to harm. Number two, a robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And then the third, a robot must protect its own existence so long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. So how is that working out for us, people? <laughs> but you know, I don't really think it's fair. Because this is a drone that's actually flown by a human pilot located far from the battlefield where it's, had, where it's been deployed. So we would like to make a little suggestion, just one little tweak, just one pull request, one patch revision to Asimov's first law. We propose law 1.1 by changing one word. A human may not injure a human being, or through an action, allow a human being to come to harm. Imagine that future. Thank you.